Hello, health psych students. This is part two of cardiovascular disease. So this is where we left off, I believe, talking about hypertension. Um, okay, some diagnostic issues with uh, having your blood pressure taken. There's this thing called white coat phenomenon, which really it should be called scrubs phenomenon because it's norm normally nurses who are in scrubs who take our blood pressure in a healthcare setting as opposed to a medical doctor in a white coat, but it's called white coat phenomenon anyways. And the white coat phenomenon is individuals who've had high blood pressure readings and they're really nervous about it. Just having their blood pressure taken and seeing that the nurse or the doctor um, tends to make them anxious and raises their blood pressure. Um, the digit preference was in the olden days when a person would take your blood pressure manually and would look at the dial and the digit preference would be like, say the nurse says your blood pressure is 120 over 80 and it's really 121.5 over um, 80.5, but it gets rounded or the digit preference based on the dial. Cuff size, um, normal adults like me would need a normal adult cuff size. Children um, need a smaller pediatric size. And then if you're taking blood pressure in a person who is obese, you need to use a larger cuff. Um, ambulatory monitoring is actually better because when we get our blood pressure taken, we oftentimes think like that is our blood pressure all the time. And really it's our blood pressure in that minute that they have captured. And remember we talked about the fact that blood pressure is dynamic and is meant to be a, meant to be dynamic. That's a good thing. Um, and so the ambulatory monitoring is when a person wears a cuff that will periodically inflate and take their blood pressure and record it on a computer chip. Um, and that way for individuals where that's been prescribed, the doctor can take a look at their blood pressure dynamically day and night, and then try to link are there specific things um, throughout the day, throughout the evening um, that might be stressful for them. Um, and if so, then paying attention to those things that are stressful. Um, it can take a look at if there's weird things happening um, and if there's spikes. So the stress test, many of you exercise science uh, students in this class have probably uh, either witnessed a stress test or administered one over in exercise science. That is when you put an individual on a treadmill and they, they warm up, but they walk to a point as long as they're safe and healthy, they're having their blood pressure and the heart rate monitored, all that stuff. Um, walking so fast that they actually have to hold on and taking a look at when there's physical stress on the body, what happens to the blood pressure. Um, trying to take a look at if their cardiovascular system can handle the stress of physical exercise. Now, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the upside and the downside of this. The upside is you're looking at your body under physical stress. The downside is you're not looking at your body under psychological stress. So there was a study conducted at Duke a while back where they studied these false negatives. So these were people who had had a stress test in their doctor's office and it was negative. It said you are not at risk for um, a heart attack or stroke. But then those individuals did have a heart attack after that negative stress test. And the Duke researchers got in there and they did psychological stressors. And what they found was that under psychological emotional stress, these people were hot reactors. So they would have a lot of cardiovascular reactivity, big bumps in blood pressure and heart rate under the psychological stressor. But if particularly if they were physically fit, they weren't having any kind of um, weird ratings or things when they were on the, the on the treadmill and the stressor that they use and you all can imagine this is they will oftentimes start with start at 100 and count back by seven like come on come on, come on. hey you can't handle seven start at 100 and count back by by threes and people are like oh counting backwards and then that starts to elicit some some stress for some individuals um, for treatment for hypertension um, the behavioral treatments tend to be um, training people in a relaxation technique like we learned in the stress management lecture. It could be progressive muscle relaxation, it could be meditation, um, it could be imagery, uh, diaphragmatic breathing. If they're doing biofeedback where they're taking physiological recordings, they will oftentimes do thermal, looking at the temperature um, in the fingertips. Because when we are relaxed, our, our feet and our hands are nice and warm because of good blood flow. When we are stressed, blood flow tends to go from our extremities into our trunk. And then, so our hands get kind of cold and clammy. Um, and so teaching people how to get e nice, even blood flow all over their body tends to help relax their blood pressure. 
Um, there are a bunch of different medications and I, what I want you to know, cause this is not a pharmacy class. I just want you to know there are different families of medications and most doctors will start with a diuretic and the diuretic makes you pee frequently. Um, urinate frequently. And so that decreases overall blood volume. People on diuretics have to be really careful to make sure they don't get de dehydrated because, um, because their body, they're taking this, this medication that is helping them reduce overall fluid. If most doctors start with diuretics, if that doesn't work to bring blood pressure down, um, to normal, they will oftentimes add another family, one of these other medications, um, to, to see, what works and what doesn't work. And one of the ways that we determine when people have high blood pressure, but they're on medication, so their blood pressure really isn't high because of the medication, oftentimes the way the severity of their blood pressure is indicated is how many different families of meds do they have to be on to control their blood pressure. Some adherence issues to the, to the medications. Um, there are a lot of aversive side effects for these blood pressure medications. And so we get into this interesting non-compliance issue with a lot of individuals. So remember, blood pressure, high blood pressure is silent, silent killer. And so here you are, like you do, you weren't feeling your high blood pressure. Um, you go to your doctor, your doctor is like, oh, this is scary. Let's put you on medication. You start taking the medication and it either creates sexual dysfunction for you or you're feeling down and depressed, or you're feeling tired, uh, or heavy, um, or dizzy, particularly dizzy when you go from sitting to standing up, and it's expensive. And so that is, let's think back to our behavior modification, that is, you've added something, and now you're having these side effects, it is positive punishment. And punishment, remember, tends to decrease behavior. So what happens for a lot of individuals, they can't feel the high blood pressure, doctor gives them this medication, they, they've added the medication to the scenario, and now they're experiencing these aversive side effects. A lot of people just stop taking their medication. So that's the non-compliance or the non-adherence. Um, and this is common. It's very common for um, blood pressure meds. And then individuals their blood pressure goes back up and then they have consequences. Um, so more vulnerable to heart attacks or stroke. Ideally what doctors do if, if the blood pressure is really high is put them on the meds first um, and then get them into lifestyle change, changing their diet, uh, getting them exercising, having them do their relaxation and their meditation, managing their stress better, and then try to wean them off the meds over time, which is very rewarding for people if they're having those aversive side effects. So coronary heart disease, um, is when the arteries that feed the heart muscle um, become narrowed or clogged up. And then because they become narrowed and clogged up, the heart muscle itself starts to get deprived of oxygen. And so when you get these injuries to the endothelium, the, so the inside of the arteries, um, like by, because of a surge in blood pressure, like we talked about, um, back when we did the, the masculine gender role stress. Um, and then that creates tears. And then there's that whole immune system and, and attempt to, to heal. There's a fibrinolysis where it kind of lays down the scabbing inside um, the arteries. And then let's say that person drinks um, a milkshake and it eats a cheeseburger and there's all these triglycerides and this cholesterol flowing through and the fibrinolysis has created this sort of sticky, sticky kind of catchment. And then you get these fat molecules that come by and get stuck there. Um, and then that creates plaque. And so if you can kind of see this right here inside this fatty hardening type of uh, plaque tissue, it's the plaque buildup that we call atherosclerosis. So there's two types of We've got arteriosclerosis, which is a thickening and a hardening of the arteries. Um, and then the atherosclerosis is the plaque buildup inside the arteries. And these two disease processes tend to, tend to coincide and happen over time. Um, so we do lose elasticity. So we get that hardening and that loss of elasticity. Men sooner than women, remember, women have the advantage of estrogen protecting that elasticity up until menopause. Um, so you get these two disease processes together and that is driving the coronary heart disease. So the arteries are, are very, getting hard, not as elastic. Um, and then you've got plaque buildup. And then if you get surges in blood pressure, you can keep, keep getting those injuries. Um, 
And so how severe it is, like you can see over here on the right is very severe clogging. On the left, you've got nice and normal, um, healthy artery with good blood flow. So types of diseases in coronary heart disease, angina pectoris, so you think about pectoral muscles, is when there is chest pain, so tightening or chest pain, and that's because of restricted blood flow to the heart, and we call that restricted blood flow, it creates this process of ischemia. And ischemia is when the heart tissue is not getting the oxygen that it needs for its nutrients. And if that uh, is so severe that the heart is so deprived of oxygen, has so much ischemia, then that is going to, to trigger what is called an MI or myocardial infarction. And the infarct is when the tissue dies. So you got that ischemia. And if that heart muscle is not fed oxygen and it dies, um, then that is the infarct. And depending on how many arteries are affected and how much of the heart muscle is affected, if the, if the entire heart muscle is affected, that person's gonna die right away. If it, let's say it's just one of the coronary arteries that feeds into the heart, that person might have a mild heart attack. Um, a cerebrovascular accident, I think it's interesting, and even my son when he was younger, I don't know how we were on this conversation, he was like, mom, if they call it a heart attack, why do they call it a stroke? Why don't they call it a brain attack? And I was like, that's a good point, son. Um, anyways, but we don't, we call it a cerebrovascular accident or we call it a stroke. And there are two types of stroke. So the ischemic stroke is the most common that's driven by cardiovascular disease. So if you think about clogged arteries um, feeding the heart causing a heart attack, the exact same thing is happening with clogged arteries feeding uh, the brain. And if they are big arteries like carotid arteries and that gets blocked, then that, that whole brain is going to die pretty quickly. If it's smaller blood vessels in different parts of the brain that get blocked, that person could have a milder stroke. And what doctors do, depending on where it is in the brain, it's going to affect that person in different ways. So ischemic is the most common that we see in, um, in the U.S., a hemorrhagic stroke um, is when there's usually a head injury. So um, remember Phineas Gage, he had the railroad spike go through his head and he managed to survive it, but he had dramatic personality changes. That would have been a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, my father, when he had his cycling accident, what happened with him is his head hit the pavement um, and his brain bounced. And what happened is he started to get a bleed where on the other side of the skull where, because the brain tissue had, you know, gone down and then bounced back and it created the bleed on the other side of where he hit impact on the pavement. And what the doctors eventually had to do was um, get in there. He had a hematoma, so he had a bleed that was hardening and remove that part of the brain to stop the whole inflammation process. Another common form of hemorrhagic stroke is um, you've got a soldier in the field that has been hit with an IED. And so there's been this big blast of pressure and that can create where the brain bounces in the skull and bruises, which is why they, they've trained medics nowadays. They're even doing burr holes in the field. It used to be you had to get back to um, a military hospital before a surgeon could put a hole into the skull to try to release the pressure. But now the medics um, can do that in the field if they realize a person's got a head injury. Because as soon as that brain starts inflaming, think about one way of thinking about it. It's one thing, let's say, to get a big bruise on your arm and it might swell because it's got room to swell. If you've ever had a bruise underneath your nail bed or your toe bed, that is so painful because there's swelling that's going on, but because of the nail bed, it can't swell out. And so what doctors do with that is they put a burr hole, usually they hit up a paper clip and put a burr hole in and release the blood so that it's got the swelling's got somewhere to go. That's what's going on in the skull. Our skull in in cases, and so if you get any inflammation going on in the brain, it is very, very dangerous because inflammation in one part could start to create swelling all over the brain and that could create hemorrhagic stroke and death. Okay, so all these horrible ways people can get sick and die here. Um, Cerebrovascular accident, um, I want you to know that there is stroke awareness um, and I'm gonna click this website and let's see if I can just sort of show you. Um, yeah, 
So just sort of know this. The overreact to stroke campaign is because, first of all, a a brain tissue dies much quicker than heart tissue. So, I mean, certainly having a heart attack is a medical emergency. Having a stroke is a very serious medical emergency that needs to be treated very quickly. And oftentimes individuals um, don't like react or what happens for a lot of individuals when they're having a stroke, it can easily look like they're concussed or it can easily look like they're drunk. And so oftentimes individuals um, around the person who's having the stroke um, assume other things are going on. And the overreact to stroke is just a whole campaign that is encouraging individuals um, to react very quickly. Here are some of the, the symptoms you see, and you can sort of see it looks like, I mean, think about being, you know, somebody, if you've seen somebody drunk before, confused, difficulty understanding, feeling dizzy, loss of balance, um, feeling numb, having a headache having difficulty speaking, having problems walking, vision, weakness. Um, and so those are many of the symptoms and you want to call 911 immediately. Some of the non-modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease, so both heart attack and stroke, is age. And women are usually 10 years behind men because of uh, estrogen protecting them. And what you'll see here is in the 30s, 40s, you've got very rare, and then it bumps up higher, and then 65 um, plus, it is um, one in four risk. So very high risk factors after, after 65. Race, we've talked about um, African Americans being more at risk for um, Caucasians and other uh, races in the US that is also confounded somewhat by higher rates of obesity and higher rates of diabetes in African Americans. Um, and so epidemiologists get in there and look at those variables and they try to partition them and, and pull that out. Having a strong family history of cardiovascular disease, I have uh, cardiovascular disease everywhere in my family, um, my maternal side, my paternal side. Um, and so genetically, I consider myself to be very high risk, which is why lifestyle has certainly probably helped to mitigate risk for me. People of low socioeconomic status um, are at much higher risk for cardiovascular disease. But again, that oftentimes gets confounded by um, body mass index. You see more obesity in low SES individuals, more cigarette smoking, tobacco use, more sedentary lifestyle and high low density lipoprotein. So lots of uh, risk factors. The modifiable risk factors, um, hypertension, uh, trying to control that with lifestyle medication. Cholesterol levels, the low density lipoproteins tends to be the so-called bad cholesterol. And one way I think about uh, remembering that LDL, low density lipoproteins, we want them to be lower in people. The high density lipoprotein is the so-called good cholesterol. It finds the bad cholesterol and tows it to the liver and out of the body. So one way, again, I remember that high density lipoprotein, we want to be higher. And what doctors actually will look at is if you've got high cholesterol, the ratio of the high to the low, um, and know that there's a lot of lifestyle changes, particularly exercise, that helps us raise our HDL, which is a good thing. Triglycerides are a different kind of fat that lead to, um, so all of this could be modified with exercise and it can be modified with diet. Cigarette smoking, certainly we can help individuals cut back if not quit smoking. Um, diabetes management and particularly metabolic syndrome that we've talked about helping manage that because once a person has metabolic syndrome, it leads to increased weight gain and you start to see uh, exponential acceleration of risk of cardiovascular disease once a person has metabolic syndrome. Um, obviously the physical activity, getting people moving and then helping individuals um, manage obesity. But one of the things that you're gonna see when we get to the obesity lecture is obesity is overconsumption of food and it is lack of exercise and sedentary lifestyle for some people who are obese. But it's really the sedentary lifestyle combined with obesity that is particularly dangerous for individuals. And there are, this will surprise some of you, but we'll talk about the research when we get to obesity, there are individuals that are fat and fit. And the fat and fit individuals are actually healthier than lean people who are not fit, who are very sedentary, who don't engage in regular exercise. So we'll help tease apart those variables a little more when we get to obesity. 
So metabolic syndrome is when individuals have three or more of these particular risk factors. So elevated waist circumference, so that would mean that their waist is bigger than their hips. So waist to hip ratio over one is dangerous. Um, there's some really interesting research. I've done some research on clothing size for body image myself in my lab, and we, we developed this thing called relative size. And it was taking your dress size if you're a woman or your pant size, which is usually waist size for a man, and then asking what your size is, and then asking people what their ideal size would be, taking that discrepancy, if there is a discrepancy, and using that discrepancy as a poor body image metric. And uh, the research that we did years ago on relative size, it performed beautifully as a body image um, metric. I should get back and do some more of that research. There's other research where they've looked at um, uh, bus drivers and people that have to wear uniforms and their uniform size, higher uniform size tends to mean higher waist to hip ratio, tends to be a predictor of cardiovascular disease in, in people who, workers who wear uniforms. Elevated triglycerides, so that bad um, uh, fat. Um, low HDL, so low of the high density low protein, high blood pressure, and elevated fasting glucose, which is going to be either prediabetes or a sign of diabetes. And again, once a person has a metabolic syndrome, part of the reason why they've made this a disease diagnosis is so that it gave physicians a, a disease to treat, to try to prevent the escalation of cardiovascular disease in individuals. But again, once a person has metabolic syndrome, you could have one of these things and be at much lower risk than if you have three or more of these things combined. And again, once a person has metabolic syndrome, it actually makes it easier for them to gain weight, develop diabetes, um, and develop cardiovascular disease. Um, so some assessments for diagnosis. Um, I want to play the Go Red. Let's see if I can play this and keep my screen share going. I love this campaign. I love Elizabeth Banks. Um, this is a campaign um, for women um, to help them realize their high risk for cardiac It started disease. out like a totally normal day. Objection deadline to the third line after survey. Oh, please. Please. Did you finish your breakfast? Ow. Ooh. Don't hit your brother. You have to eat something. Here. Okay, five minutes to carpool. You okay, Mom? Oh, I'm fine. What do you want? Almond butter and jelly. Okay, Daddy. You sure you're okay? I'm fine, sweetie. I'm so late. Stay what are you doing? My stomach's upset. Hey, honey. Mm. You okay? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Oh, yeah. Here. Acai, my favorite. Mm. See you guys later. Where are your shoes? Put your shoes back on, please. You know, go help your sister. We're going in three minutes. God, what am I doing? I forgot to cut off the crust. She's looking a little drunk, as in shape. Voila. Shoes on, potty if you need it. How to get your sister. Okay, here. Nobody move. I'm getting a dustpan. Oh. Mom. Mm. I think you're having a heart attack. Honey, do I look like the type of person who has a heart attack? <laughs> Totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. Come on, Mrs. Underdog is not going to wait. <sighs> oh. Okay. Nine. I'm sorry to bother you. <laughs> I might be having a little heart attack. Nothing really, just some nausea, tightening of the jaw, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh, really? They can be here in how long? <gasps> Two minutes. Can you make it 10? I thought I had gas. Turns out, I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of my heart and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. 
That's nice, sweetie, but that's not my heart. That is. <laughs> Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org. So I love Elizabeth Banks. She did not have a heart attack. She just uh, wrote and directed and starred in that, that ad to try to educate women um, that they need to take their risks seriously. When she took the Tums, remember we talked about how um, first responders and emergency room doctors will oftentimes misconstrue and miss a heart attack in women. They don't treat it as aggressively. A lot of times women will have stomach issues and men are more likely to have pressure and pain or pressure on their back. Um, and so, and it just has to do with the way blood flow, um, gets abrupted, um, in women, but she was taking those Tums, um, and, like she had a stomach ache kind of thing, or like she said, I thought I had gas. Um, so diagnosing a heart attack, um, ideally you take a complete, uh, patient history. If the patient history is known, if there's somebody there that knows the patient history and assuming that the patient is not unconscious. Um, they use a EKG, which is measuring the electrical um, wave of the heartbeat to see if there's any irregularity. It took me a long time to understand why it's called EKG, because electrocardiogram, you would think it would be ECG, but it comes from the German word cardio that is spelled with a K. So that's the origin of that. Um, if there's a re irregular heartbeat, it could be because there's some tissue that has um, died. The enzyme test is a blood test where when the heart tissue, when cells die, they release these enzymes, they release these chemicals, um, and that can be measured in the bloodstream. So blood tests looking for the enzymes to indicate if there's muscle damage. And echocardiogram is where they bounce sound waves and will take a look um, to examine damage in the, the heart muscle or to look for blood clots in the, in the heart. The coronary angiogram is actually the um, best way of diagnosing a heart attack. And what they do with an angiogram um, is they line through the groin, go up into the heart muscle and shoot dye where you're under the special kind of x-ray scanning device. And when they shoot the dye, if the dye goes everywhere it is supposed to, then you're doing fine. However, if the dye like comes to a point right here and then it doesn't go any further, then you've got a total blockage in that coronary artery. What happens in some situations, they shoot the dye and teeny tiny little bits of dye are getting through, then you've got a partial blockage. So it is the, the healthiest, uh, the most accurate way of actually diagnosing um, the heart attack. And then the, the pictures that it takes are called an angiogram. I had a client years ago, she was a, um, a woman postmenopausal. she had um, grown children, and her, she was having some symptoms, so her doctor recommended that she go into the hospital and have an angiogram um, diagnostic test done, and she did, but she decided, it's kind of like the Elizabeth Banks thing, she decided not to tell her husband where she was going that day, she decided she wasn't gonna tell her grown daughters um, that where she was going that day. She had her angiogram, her heart was fine, which was good news, but she's sitting in the recovery room and the little plug that they put in where they threaded through her groin, the plug came loose. And so she's sitting in her hospital bed and blood is squirting everywhere. And she said she had this moment where she's in this bleeding crisis where she was like, hmm, maybe I should have told somebody who, who knows me where I went today, you know, kind of thing, thinking that she was, oh my gosh, you know, I could die right here, bleed to death, and, I, and nobody knows where I'm at. Um, yeah, so people tell, tell your loved ones when you go out to us. Okay. Okay, so medication treatments. Um, there are, just like there are all these different families of meds for the blood pressure medication, there are all these different families of medications um, to treat the heart and blood pressure um, as well as the heart muscle. And again, I'm not gonna expect that you all um, know all of these. This is not a class in pharmacy, um, but I will talk a little bit about how they, they tend to work. 
Nitroglycerin uh, dilates blood vessels, and I've known individuals who will even wear a little capsule a rent with a necklace. So when they start to get that angina and that chest pain, they pop a nitroglycerin under their tongue and it, it starts to dilate blood vessels. It's the those medications that have really gnarly interactions for men who are taking some type of erectile dysfunction medication like um, Viagra or Cialis, that stuff. Those things are really bad in combination because you get way too much dilation of blood vessels um, and it could kill people, give them a heart attack or a stroke. Both the calcium and the beta blockers um, reduce lower blood pressure, reduce demand on the heart. The vasodilators expand, help expand narrow arteries. The anticoagulants, um, which are used, anticoagulants and aspirin are used very quickly, particularly for stroke, because they help prevent or dissolve blood clots. Um, and then aspirin is a natural blood thinner. And if you've got, um, a lot of people are taking baby aspirin on a regular basis if they are at risk for cardiovascular disease. If you've got aspirin handy and somebody's having chest pain or somebody's having stroke symptoms, give them an aspirin right away as you call 911. Two major surgical treatments that are performed um, very frequently in the United States. Um, cabbage is coronary artery bypass and grafting. And you've got a picture up at the top of cabbage where they cut through the sternum they rib spread and they get in there, they take a vein from the leg and they reroute. You're seeing, let me see if my cursor's working. So right here, you've got a blocked artery where they're taking that vein and they're rerouting around the damaged coronary artery or the clogged coronary artery. It is open heart surgery. It's going to, it creates very dramatic, um, Recovery, I had a friend who underwent coronary artery and bypass surgery, and he talked about sleeping so deeply at night and during the day. He couldn't, he wasn't allowed to drive for six weeks because they cut through your, your pectoral muscles. And so just things like picking up a gallon of milk or being able to control your steering wheel in your car, um, you're, you can't do that stuff for a while until you do enough physical therapy for everything to heal. Cabbage is normally done when there are more serious clogged arteries um, or multiple clogged arteries. Um, so more likely when there's closer to full blockage. But remember we've talked about early in the semester in the US, if you are well insured and you are deemed in need of cabbage, they will perform that surgery very quickly, almost as if it's an emergency. However, when we've compared um, people who are equally sick in the U.S. who get that surgery very quickly to Canadians who get, because they ration these surgeries in Canada because they're on universal health care. Um, remember, their cost is much lower. They put people on a wait list. Um, and remember, the Canadians are like, oh, no, you know, oh, no, I need surgery, but I don't want a wait list. Um, and many of those individuals um, aren't in an emergency need of a heart attack. And many of those individuals will start engaging in lifestyle change and take upon themselves their own responsibility to eat more healthfully, to exercise, to manage their stress, as well as taking medications. The mortality rates are not different. You would think that Canadians were dying off like flies because they're in need of a surgery, but they have to wait to get it. Whereas in the US, um, everybody's getting the surgery. No difference in death rates for people who are equally sick, which sort of says to me, we're doing way too many of these surgeries. We should be focusing a lot more on prevention and lifestyle change. PTCA, um, which normally we call angioplasty, many of you have heard that term if you, if you haven't had um, courses on this, is percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. And again, that's where they thread through the groin, up and shoot the dye. And let's say that the, the dye is not moving through on this coronary artery. Then what they do is they go in with a balloon. The balloon inflates and opens up that coronary artery. And keep in mind, if you just let it go, it's gonna go back. So what they do is they, they, thread, they thread up, they put the balloon in, the balloon opens up the artery, then they go in and they put in a stent. And the stent, it almost, in the olden days, it would look like a pin, the thing that would click a uh, writing pin. Anyways, y'all probably don't know about that stuff. You, you type, you don't use pens. But anyways, um, it would open it up and allow to keep the blood flow um, going through there. So it's a balloon stents. Um, they clear out uh, any, any plaque that's in there. 
But keep in mind about 40% of those close again in, within six months. So we're doing these very expensive um, surgeries, cabbage and angioplasty in the United States. But it is the way that I think about these surgeries, they are very expensive band-aids, okay? Band-aid meeting, taking care of the immediate problem, um, okay? There are other heart diseases. Cardiac arrest is when the heart stops. That's when you need a, um, an electrical shock um, to be able to get them uh, back, their heart beating again. There are valve defects and genetic disease and then peripheral vascular disease. I focused on heart attack and stroke because those are the most common um, forms of cardiovascular disease. And they're the most common forms of disease and death um, in the United States. But I just want you to know there's other stuff. There's a lot of other kinds of diseases out there that we're not covering in this course. Okay, so let's spend some time on cardiac rehab. And let's talk about the referral thing first. So if you've had a heart attack and you've been in the hospital, you've had one of those surgical procedures, and then you get discharged from the hospital, the best thing for everybody who's had a heart attack is to get them to a cardiac rehab program. However, a lot of people don't get to a cardiac rehab program. And so there's two different things that, that happen that can assist in getting that person into a cardiac rehab program. If they're discharged, so they're, elect they're electronic discharge, people oftentimes giving paperwork, says, here's the contact information for you to go to a cardiac rehab program. So that's the discharge referral. And then second would be the healthcare professional advising that patient to go to a cardiac rehab program. So as an example, we know for women over the age of 50, the number one reason why they go and get a mammogram, which is, which is recommended to, to detect breast cancer in women over the age of 50, is their healthcare provider, their PA, their medical doctor, their family nurse practitioner, whatever, says, I want you to go get a mammogram. Here is the, the number for our local radiology clinic that does that. Then women go do it. If the healthcare practitioner doesn't say, I want you to go get a mammogram, most women don't do it, okay? So what we're seeing here is that 75% will go if, they, if they're both given the electronic discharge and the healthcare professional advises them to go, okay? Now you would think 100% of people would be getting the electronic discharge and the cardiologist giving them the referral. Got a quick story to tell. So when I was supervising um, the uh, master's level psychologist in our local cardiac rehab program at Watauga Medical Center, um, we had several older um, cardiologists in the community that would regularly refer their patients. And so there was a steady stream of new patients coming into the cardiac rehab program um, all the time. So you had people completing the program and being released from cardiac rehab who were much healthier at that point. And then you had a steady stream of people coming in. And our, uh, an elderly cardiologist in the community who everybody adored, he retired. And so the hospital system had to hire this temporary cardiologist. And so they hired this younger temporary cardiologist to come and serve the community. And then all of a sudden in the cardiac rehab program, patients stopped getting referred. They stopped coming in. Um, and I remember, you know, talking with the master's level psychologist going, does anybody know what's going on? Like, why aren't there new patients? Um, you know, they're performing procedures. You know, people are having heart attacks until my partner, JP, was having a beer at Boone Saloon um, one afternoon and he was sitting next to this other man and this other man kept going outside and smoking cigarettes and he said the dude was hitting hitting the beers back pretty heavy and they struck up a conversation and jp realized he that guy was the temporary cardiologist the younger temporary cardiologist serving the community and he's drinking heavily and he keeps exiting boone saloon to smoke cigarettes he was not a healthy dude. And guess what? Remember, we talked about this early in the semester. If we can get healthcare providers healthy, they are a lot more likely to counsel their patients on lifestyle change than healthcare workers who are not healthy themselves. It would feel very hypocritical and bring a lot of cognitive dissonance. So unhealthy healthcare professionals tend not to recommend lifestyle change for their patients. I'd be hypocritical. So that's what was happening in Boone for a while. We had this pretty unhealthy cardiologist serving our community and cardiac rehab wasn't getting referrals. What this study also showed, 50% will go to cardiac rehab if it's either the, the advice on the electronic discharge 
or it's the healthcare provider advising them. And almost 30% of people will go um, with just typical care. So basically what we just need to make sure that the healthcare providers are doing and the nurses who are in charge of the discharge that are just referring people to cardiac rehab um, and getting their, them there, you know, they're not gonna improve if they don't get there. One of the things that we've seen um, in research is that it is best to focus on one behavior at a time for cardiac rehab patients. Usually they're focusing on all kinds of different behavior all at once. So as an example, trying to get the smoker to quit, getting them in supervised exercise, um, giving them counseling for dietary changes, giving them counseling for their stress, or if they've got a psychological disorder, getting them in treatment if they've not been treated. Um, but I'll tell you a story about one of the cardiac rehab um, patients that we got in the local community that was upsetting a lot of the staff. It was upsetting the nurses and the doctors and the nutritionists. And he was a university professor who had had a heart attack and he was a cigarette smoker. And he very much believed that uh, his cigarette smoking helped him concentrate. And Professor Jobs are pretty intellectual. And so being able to concentrate, being able to concentrate and write our research, that type of thing. He, so he gets into the cardiac rehab program and um, he's, he's very assertive and he's just sort of like, I will do anything you professionals in here want me to do. I will exercise, I will get to running marathons if you want me to, I will change my diet, I will work on managing my stress, but I'm gonna tell you now, I don't wanna talk about my cigarette smoking. And that was very much upsetting the staff. And I remember sitting in on a meeting with the master's level psychologist and just saying, just leave it. You know, if you keep pressing the smoking issue when he's told you up front, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to do anything about it. He's going to quit the cardiac rehab program. So if you nag him too much, he's going to quit. And it was like, just leave him alone. And what you, found, what you find is naturally, particularly once people who are smokers, who are sedentary, start exercising, it becomes unpleasant to smoke. So instead of being very reinforcing, which it was for him, it helped him concentrate mentally. Um, once he got to exercising, he was naturally cutting back on his cigarette smoking. So it's one of those things where, yeah, ideally we're focusing on all the behaviors in cardiac rehab. But for some individuals, we kind of have to be successful in one behavior first and then give them the confidence like, oh, I was able to, I was able to start exercising. I never thought I'd be able to you know, run three miles at a time type of thing, but I went from a couch potato to now I can run three miles at a time. And that, that gives them the behavior change strategies as well as the self-efficacy of like, okay, now let me work on, now I really want to work on my diet. I really want to work on um, my nutrition, nutrition, lowering my dietary fat, improving uh, the nutritional quality. Um, cardiac rehab programs, the key to them is supervised exercise. So you've got a medical doctor on, on staff, you've got nurses looking at heart rate, blood pressure, um, you've got exercise physiologists teaching or trainers teaching people how to use the equipment and how to get exercising after they've had an exercise prescription. At a level, the prescription is at a level that their body, depending on how severe their disease is, can handle. Because the appropriate amount of exercise is gonna make a cardiac patient healthier. Intense exercise in a prescription when they're not, when they're not ready for intense exercise is gonna kill them. It's kind of like that old adage you hear about people who are sedentary and they get a heavy snow and they're out there you know, shoveling heavy snow and they drop dead in the driveway. Real intense exercise for somebody whose cardiovascular system is severely damaged and is unhealthy will kill them. So the supervised exercise component in a cardiac rehab program is making sure that they start at the, a level that their body can tolerate, get exercising at that level, let their body adapt, bump up the training and the prescription, exercise at that level, let them adapt, and then they're, they're getting healthier, then they bump it up and they adapt. And again, some cardiac rehab patients, um, like I said, you know, maybe it's their life goal, they're able to walk two miles, but there's some cardiac patients that were formerly sedentary that are out there running marathons nowadays. Um, we know that um, 15 to 28% of people in a cardiac rehab program, it reduces all cause mortality. So not only um, deaths from heart attacks or stroke, but deaths from cancer, deaths from diabetes, that kind of thing. And then 26 to 31% um, reduction in cardiac deaths. 
So what this is saying, these numbers here are powerful numbers. Cardiac rehab programs work for people. Let's talk about Dean Ornish. We talked about Dean Ornish earlier in the semester. Um, in this lifestyle heart trial one-year follow-up, um, the experimental group got Dean Ornish's um, cardiac rehab program. And then the control group, they were just recommended, go out there and change your lifestyle. Get some exercise, watch your dietary fat, that type of thing. He found that those who got the, um, the lifestyle heart trial, 91% um, of them had a reduction in their angina, their chest pain. 4.5% of them um, improved the stenosis, so the narrowing of the arteries and the blockage. Um, and 37% had a reduction in their LDLs. And so if you look here, you've got 91% reduction in angina. Down here, the lifestyle only people, or the, you know, go out, just go out and change your lifestyle as opposed to doing it in a rehab program. 165%, they had an increase in their angina. They had a worsening of stenosis, whereas the cardiac rehab people got a improvement and then only a 6% reduction versus the 32% um, in the preventative rehab program. Um, keep in mind, this is that one year follow-up. Um, in a five year follow-up, there's a picture of Dean Ornish. In a five-year follow-up after they had done um, the, the preventative um, program, the people who got the preventative rehab had a 7.9% um, improvement in their stenosis, so they're still improving, and there were 25 cardiac events um, out of them. In those in the controls who had just encouraged to change their lifestyle but they weren't attending a program, they had a 27% worsening of stenosis and a lot more cardiac events. And so what Dean Ornish's research, his, his research has not only shown it is improving people after a heart attack to go to cardiac rehab, but if medical doctors send people who are at high risk to cardiac rehab for prevention, prevention works. And this is the kind of stuff that makes me feel crazy when I think about our healthcare system. Even a lot of insurance companies won't pay for the preventative cardiac rehab um, for a ticking time bomb. But after you have a heart attack, they will pay for you to have surgery. And in some cases, they will pay for you to go to a cardiac rehab program. Prevention works, people. It works. We should be doing, that should be mainstream medicine. That is what we should be doing for everybody. We should not have, be performing as many of the bypass surgeries, as many of the angiograms. We should be sending people to the lifestyle change because the science says it works. Um, problems with current treatment. So current treatment or treatment as usual is the way that we would talk about it. So treatment as usual in the US is we give people meds, we send them to bypass, we send them to angioplasty. Um, and then in a lot of cases, we don't send them to a cardiac rehab program after the heart attack. And we're definitely not sending the right people to the preventative cardiac rehab. So coronary heart disease costs the US, um, this is data from 2009, 165 billion. We know that Dean Ornish's preventative program costs $18,000 um, per patient, but treatment as usual um, tends to cost $47,000 per patient. So we would be saving just $29,000 per person if we sent all of these patients to cardiac rehab. Remember we talked about at the beginning of the semester, we've got a lot of waste, a lot of wasted money in the healthcare system, and we don't have enough money to take care of everybody in the United States in the healthcare system. And I'm sure coronavirus has made that exponentially worse right now um, because we're spending so much money taking care of COVID patients. Um, this would be a beautiful place for us to change the way that we do things in the United States when it comes to cardiovascular disease. We need to be sending people to prevention services. Other problems with the treatment as usual in the United States. We perform uh, half a mil uh, bypass surgeries per year. 50% of those bypass arteries clog up again within five years. Remember, I've talked about it's a very expensive Band-Aid. And then 80% become blocked after seven years. We are performing 600,000 angioplasties, and somewhere between 30 and 50% of them are going to re-stenose and block within a half a year. 
Okay, I'm going to stop share right now and this will be the end of part two.